very much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk to you today about point apparel for sound. Um, in terms of my background, I'm actually a general internist. I'm not a radiologist radiologist or cardiologist or anything like that. I got my interest in uh, Point Care Ultrasound uh, and during uh, residency uh, in the Navy. Had some time as an aerospace medical uh, physician establishing Point of Care Ultrasound curricula for flight surgeons and aerospace medicine residents. Uh, eventually did an ultrasound fellowship um, at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, which at the time was the only place you could do that and be a general internist and not an ER doc. Uh, and then I've kind of moved from Columbia to Greenbelt here and, and helping sort of the Greenbelt campus do what Columbia campus has been doing uh, for quite some time. Uh, my objectives for this ambitious talk is to kind of go over a point of care ultrasound. For those of you who have never uh, heard about point of care ultrasound or have any familiarity with it, kind of briefly describe it. Um, but also to touch and focus on um, a, a concept of using ultrasound like a physical exam tool, bedside tool. Uh, and, and focus on some of the cardiopulmonary applications. As general internists, um, we tend to focus on the heart and the lungs. And so I think um, to start us off, if this is your mental construct of an ultrasound machine, right, we need to bring you up to speed. It's no longer the Soviet era kind of uh, massive machine that takes two people to push around. Um, it is much, much more compact now. So we have uh, pocket-sized devices that will plug into your smartphone and will run on an app, okay? And you don't even need the cord in many cases. Um, this, this device here is actually Bluetooth directly to your phone. Um, so the technology is rapidly developing, but unfortunately, training programs are not uh, keeping pace. And so when you're thinking about ultrasound now for this talk, it's important not to just think about where ultrasound is now, but where it's headed. Anytime that you en enable a um, uh, technology with the smartphone or a tablet or something like that, you get all the technology that goes into those supercomputers that we carry around in our pocket. So you can actually utilize the cameras on those phones, and you can talk about telehealth and things like that. You can tele-ultrasound, so you can sort of see what other people are doing, not only with their hands, but also the image that they're acquiring. You can point things out on the screen. It's really fascinating. There are some companies who here have heard of Pokemon Go, uh, have kids that use Pokemon Go, right? There's like, almost like a Pokemon Go that they're trying to develop with some of the ultrasound probes so that as you're acquiring the image, they're working on the artificial intelligence that'll give you real-time feedback about where your hand is on the probe and how you need to manipulate the probe to get a better image. So there's never been a better time to sort of uh, learn ultrasound in a, if you're not a regular sonographer. There are devices that are um, integrating that AI into their, um, their software, and you can have things like the IBC diameter be measured for you. you can count, if you get the right window to get the heart, you can actually have the machine calculate the ejection fraction for you. Um, there's, I'm interested in lung ultrasound, so you can have them quantify um, um, lung water for you. Um, all this stuff is rapidly developing and getting pushed down the, the, the pipe. So we're not quite at the level of Star Trek sort of tricorder technology, however. You can't just wave an ultrasound probe over top of somebody and it gives you the right diagnosis. It's much, much more like the stethoscope it is, okay? It's less important about which stethoscope you buy and it's more important that, and, you know, how you use it, what your training is, those sorts of things. And so I think it's time to rebrand point of care ultrasound and ultrasound in general as a vital clinical skill. And this is taking off uh, in a lot of medical schools. And it needs to be taught with an integrative fashion with inspection, palpation, and auscultation. You need to have that blending of those things. It should augment our clinical reasoning as opposed to being taught to sort of replace our clinical reasoning. It's very easy to look at an image and sort of be seduced by the image, but it actually needs to fit in with the clinical picture. Um, for it to really um, um, uh, take off. And we have to recognize that ultrasound has limitations, right? And so sometimes we don't get the answer we're looking for with an ultrasound, we need some other uh, test. And that's important to know. Who here has heard of uh, Eugene Brumwald? Right, so he, read, he wrote a nice little uh, special communications with some other authors uh, about how to integrate um, ultrasound into the physical exam. And so, uh, in terms of, he's a, a legend in, in cardiology, and so again, if this is getting published in JAMA Cardiology by people like Eugene Brubwall, this is, this is real time, this is coming. Um, 
And so this is part of the reason that this is taking off so much. There's this nice study that was done actually a while ago where they compared first year medical students with 18 hours of ultrasound training with board certified experienced cardiologists with their stethoscopes. And they compared them in terms of their accuracy at detecting things. And you can see not only did the med students keep pace, but they actually blew the cardiologists out of the water in, in many aspects. And so this happens you know, at the student level. This happens at the, the resident level. And if you're comparing, you, know, uh, and you don't want to do political kind of uh, comparisons like that, you can compare the residents you know, to themselves and realize that, yes, the residents with themselves come to better diagnoses, more accurate with their exam findings before the, uh, or after compared to before they integrate the ultrasound into their, find, into their findings. So when we're talking about point of care ultrasound, what we're really meaning is not duplicating formal studies. We're talking about doing an ultrasound very rapidly, you know, less than three to five minutes, um, with a specific kind of question in mind, especially when you're first getting started. Um, it's very easy to kind of have diagnostic exploratoryism, where you're kind of moving the program, see, let's see what we find, and that can lead you astray. You should have kind of a quick question in mind. You know, is a pericardial effusion present or absent? Use the ultrasound probe, find out, okay? And so there are some people that like to think of it as a focused diagnostic test. Is there stones in the gallbladder? Yes, no. Uh, and then there are other people like myself who actually have now started routinely integrating it into my physical exam, and it's just kind of part and parcel to what I do. Uh, it's not, you know, replacing formal studies. It's not sort of <laughs> considered a gold standard test. It's not a lot of times quantitative in nature. It's much more qualitative in nature. And so what I like about point of care ultrasound is it gets us back towards that physical exam modality and stops segregating us away from this the different person sort of uh, asking the clinical question and selecting the test as acquiring the image interpreting the findings and then acting on the results. It's the same person does all of that stuff right there immediately at the bedside. And I think this is the best bridge we have to get over this diagnostic gap that we see where we're thinking to ourselves, oh my gosh, uh, you know, I can accomplish way more with ordering a bunch of labs and, and spending, a bunch of spending a bunch of money uh, compared to my traditional physical exam. This would, allows us to kind of come back to that. So, how many of you guys have heard that you can ultrasound the eyeball? Yeah. You can ultrasound the eyeball. So you can look at things like retinal detachment. You can look at things like uh, optic nerve sheath diameter as a surrogate marker for intracranial pressure. Uh, rheumatologists, you can do ultrasound for gout, right? You can diagnose gout without ever having to stick a needle into the joint based on findings of the uh, metatarsal joint. Uh, and so the applications are actually dizzying in scope, and the slide is intentionally like that. Um, the, we, we sort of pare things down when we first start to teach people kind of a core physical exam. And we wrote about it in this other medical journal, and we brought some extra copies. So if you guys are interested, you can uh, uh, check those out. We'll have them in the back. Um, but the um, approach that we use kind of is a multi-organ approach with sort of a narrow scope wanted to kind of go over this briefly with you. Um, you know, it uses essentially different windows, and based on your level of training and your clinical questions, you know, you'll look for different things. But you'll look at these windows sort of over and over again. And so this video just compares using an ultrasound uh, on the left in a physical as opposed to a traditional physical exam. Because you might be thinking, I don't have time to do this. Uh, and this video is designed to show you, yeah, you do. Um, so starting off kind of looking at the heart, taking a quick look, seeing pericardial effusion and LV function. Um, then you can also swing down to the apical view of the heart and compare the right side to the left side. Look for uh, enlargement of the right heart um, for pulmonary uh, hypertension. Swing down sort of to the epigastric view, walk the IVC up into the subdiphoid view of the heart. You can look at the IVC size. Uh, you can look at uh, pericardial effusion and LV function in the subdiphoid view if the person has COPD or something like that. Um, really great windows. You can assess the IVC size and collapsibility, just kind of like looking at neck veins. Then you can swing over to the right-hand side, uh, look at the lung bases on the right and left side. You can look at the 
gallbladder, you can look at the kidney, you can look at free fluid in the abdomen, um, you can do a surrogate marker for looking at the IVC or the aorta from that side actually. So there's lots of things that you can do kind of from the right hand side. Um, and then you swing back over, do the same sort of thing on the left hand side, look at the left lung base, splenomegaly, um, hydronephrosis, all those different types of things. Um, you can see those um, sort of right there. Then as you move from the left upper quadrant, taking some of that residual gel, bringing it down to the suprapubic view, look at the bladder size, look for ascites. This is a really useful view when the person who can't lay on the exam table is just sort of sitting up in the uh, uh, wheelchair and you're wondering, hey, do they have ascites? This is where fluid will pool. You can just kind of use the bladder as the acoustic window to check it out real quick. And so that's it. It takes about you know, two minutes to perform when you practice and do it on a regular basis. Uh, and it gives you a lot of useful information. It gives you a lot of different applications that you can potentially look at depending on your level of training and your skill set. Um, much, much more accurate from a sensitivity specificity standpoint compared to your uh, traditional physical exam. And as you can see, if you're doing the traditional physical exam as they teach you to do it, you know, and you're trying to be thorough, you know, you can actually do this um, quicker than it takes you to do sort of a very thorough physical exam. It's important to emphasize that, you know, we stress the clinical integration, the synthesizing of those findings. And a lot of times I actually don't do it in kind of this fashion where I'm just trying to go through it as quickly as I can. A lot of times I'm showing the patient the images, we're having a discussion, um, and, it, and it takes maybe just a little bit longer, but the, the context, the interaction is, is much richer. Here, interested, there's a full webinar you can find on this that's on uh, YouTube. Uh, and uh, if you're a member of the American College of Physicians, uh, you can get CME for it, but if you just want to see the, um, the webinar, you can get it for free on YouTube. And so included in that sort of approach is Bruce Camora's Cardiopulmonary Limited Ultrasound Exam. He calls it the CLUE Protocol. How many of you guys have heard of the FAST scan? It's got a great branding, it's got a good name, um, and it was kind of like the gateway drug of point of care ultrasound for emergency medicine physicians and trauma surgeons. Uh, and the CLU exam to me is kind of like the gateway drug for generalists and internists in point of care ultrasound. It focuses on the heart, focuses on the lungs, focuses on the IVC, gives you a lot of useful information. And so kind of breaking down the CLU exam is in the context of the PEARLS approach, the first view you look at is the heart. So you're only going to take, you know, one view of the heart in this in this protocol. Um, you're going to get the long axis view of the heart. If you've never seen a long axis view, I'm just going to orient you here briefly. This is a simulated ultrasound exam. This is a 3D animation. What we're doing is, is the ultrasound beam is slicing the heart down the heart's long axis. And in order to get it to look like this, you have to imagine that you're on the left hand side of the patient looking towards their right hand side. And so this is the left atrium, this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle, here's the aortic valve, here's the mitral valve, uh, there's the descending aorta, this ascending aorta sort of wrapping around and coming back through. What we use um, this is, is to look for two main things as part of the CLU protocol. The first is left ventricular dysfunction. And so you say, well, how do you simplify ejection fraction just to kind of a quick sort of cheat. Uh, and it's, it's simple, actually. This is actually what a lot of cardiologists will do. Um, we're going to pay attention to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve here, okay? During diastole, it's gonna open up. And as you watch that on the normal heart, it kind of slaps up against the interventricular septum, right? Whereas if you look over here on this heart, it almost seems like that mitral valve's kind of just burping a little bit. <laughs> opening and comes nowhere near the interventricular septum. And you don't have to be a, a cardiologist to sort of recognize, like, you wouldn't want to have this heart. If like I showed you this image and I said, this is your heart, you'd all be freaked out. And so this heart's functioning fine, this heart, not so much. And we use a surrogate marker. If it comes within one centimeter of the interventricular septum, um, we're saying it's good to go. If it is wider than one centimeter, it suggests um, moderate to severe LV dysfunction. 
The other thing we look at in this view is we look at the left atrial size in the AP diameter. And so here you can see the left atrium, and you can compare that to the aortic root. And normally this heart should be about symmetric. It should be about a third, a third, a third. Uh, and so this should be about equal. What happens is, is when you have left ventricular systolic dysfunction or you have high filling pressures for a prolonged period of time, is, is that instead of hypertrophying like the left ventricle does, the left atrium actually stretches and dilates. And so this gives you a marker of chronicity of that patient's uh, filling pressures, whether or not its um, uh, filling pressures are, have been high for an extended period of time. And so we look at left ventricular dysfunction, um, and, we, and it impacts clinical decision makings. Obviously, detecting this in your patients is important if it's unknown, because we have lots of good therapies that um, help um, uh, make this better and improve their, their prognosis. We look at the left atrium because half of all heart failure is diastolic heart failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And so that can be your clue that the person has chronically elevated left ventricular filling pressures. And so when the person who's being chronically followed for their hypertension goes from you know, hypertension only to you know, increasing their left atrial size, well, now they're starting to develop pef pef. Right? And so you can establish that in the office. And it does increase their overlying cardiovascular risk. So if you're thinking that somebody's at low cardiovascular risk and you detect the left atrial enlargement, they're actually at much higher cardiovascular risk than you might think. So next we move from the heart. We go kind of back our way through the left heart pulmonary, uh, cardiopulmonary circuit and the clue protocol. And now we look at the lungs. So now we're saying, okay, if the filling pressures in the LV are high, that backs up into the left atrium, but not everybody with high left atrial pressures develops deep congestion or congestion and pulmonary edema decompensation. Um, and so there's something else that happens there. And the development of lung water is what we're most interested in, right? Pulmonary congestion. And so here we can actually use ultrasound as a tool to uh, detect this, much better than a chest x-ray or a stethoscope. So we're just going to look at the right lung and the left lung and the anterior zones. The first time you look at lung ultrasound, it's a little jarring, right? Because when I show you pictures of the heart, and I say, hey, you're going to put the probe in the chest, you're going to get this point of cut, you get an image that looks like this. Well, this kind of looks like a netter diagram that you have floating around in your mind, and a little bit of dopamine goes off and you're happy, right? When I show you a picture of lung ultrasound, though, however, it's like, here's the probe, here's the, on the chest, we're getting this kind of plane of cut, this is the image you get. And for a lot of people, it's like, oh, like I'm driving through a snowstorm at nighttime, and I have a cataract, and one eye closed, and no, no dopamine goes off in your brain, uh, and you think, well, uh, long ultrasound support the birds. But what we're doing is, is we're essentially using the artifacts that air-filled lung creates, and we're using that as a marker for what the density of the lung is, and we interpret those artifacts uh, uh, over time as a, as a marker for like, hey, is the lung wet? If the lung looks like lung on lung ultrasound, it's abnormal because it has a very tissue dense, uh, or it has the density similar to tissue. Whereas when you have air filled lung, it creates just a bunch of artifacts. So I'll go over kind of briefly what I mean by these different artifacts. If you put the probe over top of the chest and you get this sort of plane of cut, if I superimpose an ultrasound image on top of the CAT scan, that's, that's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the ultrasound in a sagittal plane of cut. And this is a, blown up a little bit. This is what it'll look like on the screen. And what happens is the ultrasound beams come down, it hits the surface of the lung, which is just deep beneath the, the ribs there, and it hits that bright white surface of the lung. And it reflects the ultrasound beams back to the probe and says, okay, there's something that's very, very reflective right at this level. But some of those ultrasound beams, they hit the pleural surface, and they hit the probe, and then they bounce off the probe again and go back to the pleural surface, come back to the probe, and then it says, okay, there's something, since it took twice as long, it's something twice as deep. And so it puts another sort of pleural reflection right about there. And then the same process happens only at a weaker level, because you're getting less and less ultrasound beams reflecting. And you get this like ladder, horizontal pattern in the lung. And we call that pattern A-lines. 
It means the lungs are aerated, okay? Not wet. Whereas when you have wet lungs, these interlobular septa here become thickened. Uh, and you can see this on this CAT scan, the, the, these, these septal markings here at the arrows, they're all thick with fluid. And what happens is, is that generates a different type of artifact. And so instead of that horizontal artifact pattern, now we have a vertical artifact pattern. Some people re refer to this as like sunbeams coming through cloud, or searchlights, or lasers, or comet tails. All of these mean the same sort of thing. We're talking about these vertical <coughs> artifacts patterns streaming down from the lung surface down to the bottom of the screen. And conceptually, some people like to think of these as like curly B lines on a chest X-ray, because it has the same name. I like to think of them as visual equivalents, ultrasound visual equivalents of hearing crackles. Okay? It's a non-specific finding, uh, but and has to be interpreted in terms of the pattern in general. Um, but that being said, it's very, the B lines are very, very um, uh, sensitive for detecting patients with lung water, which is helpful because how many of your patients have both COPD and heart failure? A lot. And so they come in short of breath and you're wondering, is this exacerbation of their COPD or is this decompensated heart failure? So by show of hands, who thinks that the person with uh, the, the heart failure exacerbation is on the bottom. Who thinks the heart failure exacerbation is on the top? Yeah, you all pass, right? And so it's not super hard. Like this is, it's weird, it's different, but it's, it's technically not terribly challenging. And once you see a lot of this, it's just pattern recognition. We care about this because B lines have been shown in several studies to be an excellent marker for extravascular lung water, which we know is associated with bad prognosis. The, the distribution and the number correlates with severity. People who don't have a whole lot of pulmonary congestion have less B lines, and people who have severe pulmonary congestion, pulmonary edema, hypoxemia, things like that, they have more B lines. But it appears before the presence of symptoms. And so you can detect people much better than just auscultation uh, about the people who are you know, bordering on uh, decompensation. And it clears with your therapies. And so, as you might expect, there's a lot of interest in using this as a marker and a, and a target, just like di diuresing until the BNP comes down and things like that, using this as kind of a marker for who's appropriate for hospital discharge uh, and looking at who's probably going to you know, be bounced back and readmit on, uh, on, on therapies. So next we look at, we can see and detect acute decompensation. But what happens if people are sort of chronically decompensated? Well, we see them develop coronary effusions. And so we can use the right upper quadrant view and the left upper quadrant view as our marker there um, for detecting coronary effusions. The window we use is the liver. We look for the interaction between the diaphragm and the spine. And we see kidney, dia or, uh, liver. The white line there is the diaphragm sort of moving back and forth. And you can see the vertebral bodies in the, in the far field screen. What we are looking at in this orientation on the right is as if you are looking from the person's back towards their front, and you're seeing their liver, their kidney, their vertebral bodies. And then if I superimpose the uh, ultrasound image right next to it, you can see liver, kidney, diaphragm moving back and forth, and vertebral bodies. This is a CAT scan of the same sort of thing. Orienting you. And so, what we care about in floral effusion is whether or not you can see fluid above the diaphragm, up in the chest. Fluid shows up black on ultrasound, and so here you can see a pocket of fluid um, above the level of the diaphragm. Everybody see this right here? But what's more interesting is, is focusing on the fact that we can actually, in an aerated lung, um, the, the ultrasound beams hit the diaphragm and come right back to the probe. You can't see what's going on up in the chest cavity. And so the spine here actually appears to stop right at the level of the diaphragm. Whereas when there's fluid here, it, the beams can go right through the diaphragm into the chest and show you the thoracic spine. We call that a positive spine sign. Right? So if you see a positive spine sign, uh, that lets you know you have a portal fusion. Sometimes you can actually see the lung floating around the fluid in addition to that uh, spine sign. And so here what you can see is 
and then we can click that button. Uh, here you can see the positive spine sign, and then here I've just turned the ultrasound image sort of on its side, and this is the actual anatomic orientation. We're seeing this thoracic spine in the chest, all this pleural effusion, mm -hmm. and then this atelectatic lung here, there's no air inside of it. It looks like lung, therefore it's abnormal. There you go. So why do we care about pleural effusions? Well, it's a high prevalence in hospitalized patients. It's good for the detection of chronic heart failure. If somebody has dyspnea and you're thinking about congestive heart failure and you're not really sure, um, if you detect presence of pleural effusions, that increases your probability that they do have uh, heart failure, exacerbation, or uh, decompensated heart failure. And it's associated with a worse prognosis. This is um, some of uh, uh, looking at uh, pocket-sized ultrasound devices in the clinic, and if you detected pulmonary edema or effusions, uh, obviously they had a much worse prognosis um, down, down the line. So it can help you identify those patients at higher risk. So finally, we'll move to the epigastric area to talk about IVC ultrasound. IVC is kind of like your neck veins, but a lot of times people <coughs> you can't see their neck veins, and a lot of people just nowadays aren't, aren't very good at interpreting um, size and collapsibility and J waves and B waves and all that stuff. So we can use uh, the IVC as our marker instead. So here's a normal IVC in the sagittal plane, and so we're kind of cutting it right down the long axis. Here, this is an IVC that's normal in size with a little bit of respiratory collapse. When they sniff, it kind of gets a little smaller. And here you can see uh, a patient with a very abnormal, small IVC. We call this the sliver in the liver. This person probably would benefit from some volume repletion, especially if they're tachycardic, hypotensive. Whereas this IVC here is plethoric and dilated. And so as part of the clue protocol, what we care about is, is do they have a big plethoric IVC? Well, it improves our ability to assess CVP and, and, and intra intravascular volume status. It helps us distinguish those patients who maybe have tissue edema, but are intravascularly deplete and are harmed by when we try to be overly aggressive with our diuretic therapies. And so it's, it's very nice for, for that. And it also gives you sort of a surrogate marker for whether or not they have decompensated right heart failure in addition to uh, left heart failure. It's also associated with worse prognosis. And so as you can imagine, people looking at readmission rates with IVC size and diameter, uh, the bigger your IVC is right before discharge, the more likely you are to come right back into the hospital. And so uh, uh, looking at this as a, as a potential target. So the CLU protocol really ties it all together. It gives you sort of the left heart um, uh, physiology, both acute and chronic, you know, looking at left ventricular dysfunction, left atrial enlargement. And then you get to see whether or not the lungs are feeling those high filling pressures, acute in the pulmonary edema, B lines, versus chronic with the effusions. And then it allows you to sort of briefly assess right heart physiology and central venous pressure volume status. So let's go through a little quiz. We have a patient who comes in, they're short of breath. So we'll start off, we'll look at the heart. Who thinks the LV function of this heart is good? Anybody want this heart? No, this nitro valve here is just kind of burping open, right? So LV function, LV dysfunction, LV dysfunction, right? So LV dysfunction, who here thinks the left atrium is uh, small and comparable to the aortic root? Or who thinks it's bigger? Bigger, right? Bigger. So is this an acute problem? Did this just, just develop? Did this person just have an MI like a day ago or something? No, this has been a chronic problem. They've, they've had this for a long time. So then we move to the lungs. Do they have an A-line pattern or a B-line pattern in their lungs? B-line pattern, right, exactly. So do they have decompensated left heart failure? Yeah, they do. They have pulmonary congestion. And then has this pulmonary congestion been there a long time? Do they have pleural effusions here? Do we see a positive spine sign or a negative spine sign? Positive spine sign. So they've had this heart failure for a while now. And then do they have a plethoric IVC or a little small IVC? It's plethoric, yeah, it's big. It's back. The rule of thumb there you're going to use is about 2.2, 2.5 centimeters, um, but you, it's just pattern recognition a lot of times. So that person has acute on chronic left ventricular heart failure that's decompensated. Well, if this patient has a history of left ventricular systolic dysfunction, comes into the hospital, uh, and they've been on therapies and things like that, they have skinny little ankles, and they give you this history that, wow, I've had horrible diarrhea after you gave me that augmentin for my sinusitis or something like that. 
and uh, I just had the runs for about five days straight, and I, 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 I feel terrible. Well, we look at this person, and we go, oh, well, you don't want to give them fluids because uh, their heart failure, we're going to put them in a pulmonary edema. So they have heart failure, no, no mysteries there. But what kind of pattern do they have here in their lungs? Is it B's or A's? A's, right. And so they do not have decompensated heart failure at the moment. And are they filled up with pleural effusions here? Uh, when the diaphragm comes down, it kind of conceals that spine, and the spine stops right at the level of the diaphragm. So we don't see evidence of pleural effusions. And then, uh, I don't know if we, oh, there we go. Uh, this is their IVC, right there. Can you see it? It's hard to see, right? It's the sliver in the liver, right? I call this IVC, it looks thirsty to me. It's a thirsty IVC. So we would give this person intravascular, or you know, help them restore their intravascular volume. And as long as the IVC looks like this and the lungs look like this, we can continue our resuscitative efforts and feel confident about that. So it's very nice. All right. Uh, and then the more tricky one, I think, is, is you get those patients that come in, they have COPD exacerbation or something like that, this history of COPD exacerbations, recurrent COPD or asthma or something like that. But then you take a quick look at their heart and lungs, and you find some surprises, right? And so you're thinking COPD, but then you see these lungs, and you're going, hmm, that doesn't seem to match. And you see a, a right-sided pleural effusion, right? And so right-sided pleural effusion is a machine of heart failure. And they got a big IVC, so you're thinking, you know, heart failure. But then you look here, does that anterior leaflet kind of touch the interventricular septum? Kind of does. It comes real close to it, right? So we're not thinking systolic dysfunction, but what's our clue? What, 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 what do we see that's present in this, this uh, heart? Is this in yeah, the left atrium, real dilated and big. And so this person has hep, hep, and they have hep, hep decompensation. All right. So the advantages of the clue protocol, it's simple, it's easy to learn, the physiology makes sense, and it provides a very nice entryway or a structured framework for learning you know, multi-organ ultrasound. So I, I highly recommend you sort of take a look at that. The limitations, uh, it, it, it's a very simple protocol. Uh, and so a lot of times the patients have other reasons to be short of breath other than just acute decompensation, heart failure, and pleural effusions. And so it doesn't look at things like pneumonias, it doesn't take in the thorax and things like that. Into, uh, and a lot of times the apex of the lungs are, are normal in, in patients who have heart failure exacerbation, uh, and you need to look sort of elsewhere, like at the lung bases or a little lower down anteriorly. Uh, and so, and, and the thing that's my biggest beef with the pro protocol, and the reason we kind of expand on it uh, in our uh, PEARLS approach is, is that it doesn't include the abdomen at all, and there's lots of stuff we can do in the abdomen. So, take a little break. How am I doing on time? I don't know. 10 minutes? So um, we'll talk about pneumonia, complex effusions, pulmonary embolisms, and some advanced things. So here, let's look at this left side. This is the left, uh, left uh, upper quadrant view. What do we see here that's abnormal? Well, just to start the basics, what we've talked about so far. Yeah, we see a spine sign, a positive spine sign. But does this look like black fluid? No, it really doesn't. It looks more complex, right? It almost looks like the spleen on the other side of the diaphragm. It almost looks like that. Uh, and so instead of just being black fluid, this is something much more sort of complex. So if I told you this person has a history of cough, fevers, and purulent sputum, what do you think this might be down here in the left lower lobe? So it could be an empyema. Absolutely right. could be empyema. Uh, you see these little white dots right in there. There's a little, almost looks like little stars that show up. You usually don't see those in empyema. This is actually what pneumonia looks like on an ultrasound. And so it kind of looks like hepatization of the lung, right, where it looks like the liver or the spleen, only in the lung. And so uh, that's what that is right there. This person has a very small uh, consolidation actually visible on chest x-ray. Well, our experience is, is we frequently will diagnose patients with pneumonia and the chest x-ray will be negative. Uh, but if you go and get CT scans on some of those people, because there's diagnostic ambiguity, it almost always indicates the, the ultrasound findings. So again, if lung looks like lung on ultrasound, it's abnormal. 
this is a, from a pregnant patient, and of course you never want to be doing x-rays and CT scans on pregnant patients, um, but this, this patient actually had a x-ray and a CAT scan um, that, were, that were negative when she clearly had a very consolidated lung. Um, what you're seeing here is just above the vertebral bodies, you see the aorta sort of pulsating. She has got a little pleural effusion just above the diaphragm, but all this lung is consolidated. If you look here right in the white, you can see there's a, almost like a white branching pattern that sort of moves back and forth. We call those dynamic air bronchograms, and they're kind of like air bronchograms on a chest x-ray, only on an ultrasound machine. And when you move back and forth like that, um, um, it's highly specific for pneumonia. What's happening is this air is moving through sort of a pus-filled bronchus, and it causes this, this, this pattern. Uh, and so there's a lot of interest. I don't, I obviously can't teach you all of lung ultrasound in, in, in short time here, but um, there's a lot of interest in using um, ultrasound, lung ultrasound for pneumonias. And uh, there's a meta-analysis that was recently published that looked at a number of different studies that found that ultrasound is just as specific as chest x-ray for pneumonia and much more sensitive. A lot of times you have to, um, look sort of posteriorly, because a lot of pneumonias will be lung bases, and it's a very technical skill. So unlike pleural effusions, where you can be competent in pleural effusion assessment in probably an afternoon of a, of a course, um, the pneumonia, it takes a lot of uh, practice, and, and, and you have to master other skills before you can master that. Another thing about pneumonias is, is that you can use the B lines uh, as just like you can have focal crackles um, in, in pneumonia, you can have focal B lines instead of a diffuse B line pattern, and that can be suggestive of pneumonia. And a lot of times when you zoom in, right where a B line is, you can see this little chunk of a consolidation. So here's the lung surface, and all of a sudden, there's a little consolidation hiding right there. So looking at this, another application we use um, lung ultrasound is, is, is management of patients with pleural effusion. Anybody think this person has a left-sided pleural effusion on this chest x-ray? It looks like a left-sided pleural effusion on a chest x-ray, doesn't it? Well, we took a look at this guy, uh, and um, what do we see? Do we see the spine continue up here? We don't. The spine seems like it stops right at the level of the diaphragm. This person is breathing. We're seeing this curtaining artifact. This person actually does not have a pleural effusion. We were consulted to do a thoracentesis on this person. Uh, and so we saved this person an unnecessary spleen biopsy. And, uh, and right here, if we had seen this instead, you know, if this person has a huge pleural effusion, we feel good. I feel good about supervising my residents, you know, doing the tap like this. But sometimes it's better to not just sort of know, like, when to perform the procedure. It's better to know when not to perform the procedure. If you see a pleural effusion, it looks like, you know, Lord of the Rings spider has gotten in there and kind of laid a, a bunch of webs and stuff. Well, that person doesn't need a thoracentesis. That person needs chest tube lytic therapy or a VATS or something like that. So this helps you identify the people that are probably not going to do well if you um, just put in a, a, a needle. This person actually has, you know, this is your empyema right here. So you can see this, like, sludging sort of fluid just kind of just nasty. But also the diaphragm, instead of being bent around like this, it's actually bent down like this. So we know that this fluid is actually under pressure and is pushing against the diaphragm like that. So that's complicated pleural effusions. Uh, and then looking briefly at the apical view of the lung, this is the hardest, most technically challenging view to get on echo uh, because the window is about the size of a nickel. And, um, but it really allows you to compare the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. The right side of the heart is usually smaller than the left side of the heart, about two-thirds the size. Um, but here you can see that this right heart here, this right ventricle, is much bigger than the left ventricle. And this person actually has acute right ventricular enlargement. Uh, and uh, this person is and a person who has a previous normal heart like this and then becomes acutely hypoxic and short of breath and has this new right-sided enlargement. What do you guys think? PE. PE, yeah, that's exactly what they have. Whereas if you look here, this person here, you can, just like the left atrium dilates to over chronically, this person here has right atrial dilation. This 
pulmonary hypertension has been going on a long time. Yeah. And so we get we got dozens of these cases where a person comes in and they have another COPD exacerbation uh, and they're coming in and they're hypoxic, they're short of breath. Uh, and when we look at their heart, for example, um, we see uh, this. So this is dilated RV uh, and a patient who has a COPD exacerbation. You say, well, they could have pulmonary hypertension. Well, he didn't have a history of COPD before and his lungs are clear, he's not really wheezing very much. Uh, and if we look at his legs here and we compress his femoral vein, it does not compress completely. And so you can actually see the little thrombus kind of floating around right in there. So this person has a presumptive diagnosis of PE, has lytic therapy, and actually uh, 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 survives this hospital course and, and bleeds without oxygen and no pulmonary hypertension. So the, the, uh, the time is very exciting. Get involved in clinic care ultrasound now. There's a lot of um, schools kind of following in the, the footsteps, University of South Carolina in Columbia. They've had nine years of teaching and integrating ultrasound into the curriculum of the med students there. Uh, and now over 60 schools in the country are, are following suit. We're going to try to um, complete our four-year curriculum for our medical students in Greenville in about two years. We have the first two years down, but we haven't got the third and fourth year down. Um, but this is the wave of the future, and so um, you're going to see lots and lots of medical students and new trainees coming down the pipeline um, with these skill sets. And um, naturally, when you kind of go down this road, a lot of people get um, very concerned. Um, we can sort of knock off portability and availability. I used to have that as part of my talk, but it's really not a, a complaint anymore. That couldn't be more portable now. The equipment costs have come down. Um, a lot of those machines, the pocket-sized devices, they range between as low as $2,000 now uh, to about $15,000. So that price point is, is, is feasible, and a lot of them are now offering lease or rent options if you're not sure whether or not you're going to get into it. Um, you can bill for a limited ultrasound exam. There are CPT codes that allow you to do that. Um, uh, that comes with you know, um, some stringent requirements about billing, but you can, uh, you can bill. And that physical exam that I showed you, that heart, lung, abdomen physical exam, if you actually bill completely for that, that can be quite lucrative in terms of the reimbursement. The CPT codes are over, with all of those things together, it adds up to over um, uh, $200. Not sustainable for everybody to be doing that. Uh, especially all the time, but I think it, it is a way to get you to be able to afford the machine. Litigation concerns uh, are out there. You're more likely to be sued on the ER side. They have the most point-of-care ultrasound experience. You're more likely to be sued if you do not use point-of-care ultrasound and you have it available than you are to be uh, litigated for the uh, missing like the liver lesion or something like that when your only question was, you know, do they have a floral effusion? The most significant thing that people talk about is time and training. So that the, 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 it does require a time investment to learn a skill, just like playing a new musical instrument or learning to drug, juggle. It does require uh, practice and mentorship and things like that. So lots of guidelines. I don't want to necessarily go into them in detail, but there are lots of guidelines that endorse this. Even cardiology societies and um, uh, internal medicine societies are kind of getting on board. Uh, the ACP is resolved to um, enhance uh, ultrasound training for its members, and uh, this is a hot, hot topic for them this year, and working on um, creating uh, guidelines uh, in the next couple of years for internists. The Society of Hospital Medicine is all over it. They have a training pathway that you can go through, paired with the critical care societies and chest physicians on um, getting hospitalists trained in this. Um, nice editorials about designing and, 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 and developing a training program in hospital medicine and, and, and certifying competent um, physicians. I really encourage you to uh, take a, uh, if there's any left over at the end, uh, to grab the uh, Southern Medical Journal uh, issue we did in July, painted a lot of um, broad, broad brush, and we covered everything from outpatient use to inpatient <laughs> use to rural, remote areas uh, um, and, and perspective pieces. Um, so if you're thinking to yourself, like, oh, you know, it's too late for me. Go now, leave me. Okay? 
if this is you, I, I do want you to think uh, and, and, and lean, lean on some of these. We had some perspectives from, from people who are at the very tail end of their career, and it's totally changed their life, and they love it. And in terms of burnout and wellness and things like that, patient connections, um, they've really found that it enhances all of those things. Uh, if you go to this, um, um, Janice Boughton's blog, Why is America healthcare, American Healthcare Expensive? <laughs> so expensive.blogspot.com, you will find that um, she goes to Tanzania and does a lot of mission work and things and does locums work and she's comfortable doing all those things because she's so empowered now as a general internist. Uh, lots and lots of great things. So, to summarize. <laughs> Point of care ultrasound is not traditional ultrasound, right? And I think it's better than traditional ultrasound. It's the wave of the future for internal medicine uh, and, and for general practice. Um, I think, think, think about where ultrasound is heading, not just where it is now, because if you want to think about the training as kind of an investment. Uh, you can use cardiopulmonary ultrasound to look for left ventricular dysfunction, left atrial enlargement, pulmonary edema, uh, pleural effusions, IVC size, part of that clue protocol. It's a very nice entryway. And then if you want to learn more about like the ultrasound physical, I would suggest the Pearl's approach. And then if you have you know, um, lots of apprehension about the numerous applications, Start small, start with a very narrow focus, and then build your skills kind of gradually over time, and then you know, practice and get mentorship. So with that, um, there's some references for you, and I'm happy to take any questions.